Hey everybody, Coldon here with another Vox Immortalis commentary guide. This video is for the heroic version of Nefarian in Blackwing Descent, and of course this shows the 10-man version. And I'm really excited to have this video coming out because this was a very cool fight, uh, very challenging, by far the, the hardest fight that we've attempted so far in heroic, and it took us uh, about 200 attempts total to get our strategy down. And you know, we haven't perfected it per se, but, um, you know, it was good enough to get a kill. And a lot of the stuff has become muscle, muscle memory, as uh, one of our raiders mentioned earlier. So, you know, it really just comes down to practicing the various phases um, and getting your sort of strategy for each individual phase down and then putting them all together. Maybe that sounds obvious, I guess. But anyway, so for the heroic version of this fight, if you've seen our normal strategy guide for normal Nef, you may remember we use two tanks, but have one tank take both dragons, so the other tank can han handle the adds because we don't have very much CC. But on heroic, this just isn't doable because the damage from the dragons is way too high. Not to mention on the raid from the lightning discharge. So instead we had to come up with a way to CC, and without a lot of single target CC, we ended up using a Frost Death Knight to pick up all the adds initially. And you may have seen he pulled them all to the left there on the side of Neff. And he pulls them with his Snare uh, and Dot. And then once they're all basically in position, he'll use Hungering Cold to stun them all. Once uh, Hungering Cold is about to end, our Mage then uses Frost Nova to root them in place. And then just before that ends, he uses Ring of Frost cast around the adds so that once they start to move out, they get frozen from Ring of Frost. Once Ring of Frost ends, then two or three of them should be dead, and the others will just beat on the Death Knight generally, and you can heal them through that. Um, that said, there's a lot of random bullshit that can happen with that. And if uh, your Death Knight or, and or Mage get Dom Dominion cast on them, which I'll explain later, but basically they get charmed, this can mess things up, um, and you know you can't heal someone that's uh, charmed, and so when he comes out, he might be low health, and it's just a nightmare. But that was the best strategy that worked for us. If you have a lot of priests or hunters, uh, those can single target CC pretty much indefinitely, and so that works really well as well. Uh, but a lot of setups will work. Mage Kiter can also do it. Anyway, so that's phase one, and I should also mention that we don't actually attack Neff at all. The only person you may have seen is our Death Knight, since he's over there dealing with the adds, so he'll throw a little damage on Neff. But all our DPS in Phase 1 is focused on Oni, just pushing her uh, over. The reason for this is primarily because uh, we just decided that the transitional DPS loss from moving DPS from Oni to Neff and back to Oni was a little bit too high. And there's also the loss of you know, ramp up time for DPS, they have to restack their dots and debuffs and things like that. Uh, so in the end, we just decided that it was better to push Oni during Phase 1 and do all our primary DPS to Neff on Phase 3. So your mileage may vary, but that that's what we decided on. So for Phase 2, the other thing we did is use Bloodlust as soon as you're up on the platform because we also found that it's best to burn through these prototypes as fast as possible. Uh, your melee DPS is not going to do anything to, to Neff on this phase, so you want to get through this as fast as you can. So all DPS are focusing their adds, which means you sort of have to balance the DPS slightly. The other thing is you didn't really get to see it on my platform in this video, but there's a new buff or debuff on this phase called Explosive Cinders. So someone will get randomly debuffed, and after 8 seconds they will explode. And anyone within 10 yards of that person takes around 40,000 damage but gets knocked really far away. So that person has to step into the lava, um, make sure you use a range check of some sort so you don't go too far away, and once the explosion uh, goes off, then they step back onto the platform. So this basically just means extra healing for the healer. It's not too bad, generally. Uh, the most dangerous part of phase two is if a healer gets the first cinders cast while everyone is going up on the platform. In that case, that healer really needs a self-cooldown, uh, the Tolberad resist trinket helps a lot, things like that. 
So if you have immunity effects like Ice Block or Devo uh, Divine Aura, or Divine Shield, I should say, uh, those will also work on that. Uh, Rogue Cloak also does it. Anyway, so once you get through phase two, you'll put Neff in the center, uh, if this is your setup. Um, this worked best for us because of rotating. So just like in normal, you'll pick up all the ads and you'll have a, a tank that kites them around the edge of the room. And this is to keep the fire away and to let him kite indefinitely. But because of this, um, if you don't position Neff properly, then this you risk the kite team getting hit by the Shadow Flame Breath or the Tail Swipe. Either one will be deadly to that tank because the add damage is really high on Heroic. So to manage this, you'll see that our warrior tank on Neff uh, actively rotates um, Neff's head so that the side of Neff, in this case Neff's left side, is always facing the kite team. This means that they're never at risk of taking damage beyond that from the adds or electrocute. So this helps a lot. The downside is that it does lower your DPS on Neff because the raid has to constantly rotate. This also means that um, things that are sort of stationary like totems or traps also have to be placed over and over and over. But it's really a no-brainer. You can't afford to risk the kite team getting hit by something from Neff, so you have to do it. Um, so I'll go ahead and explain the final difference in Heroic, which happens on Phase 1 and Phase 3. You see, just a moment ago, I got a debuff called Dominion. And this is cast fairly frequently on those two phases, on two random raid members. Uh, the only people that can't be targeted are the tanks. And when you get Dominion, you'll see on the right there, our mage and our uh, bounce druid are both slowly walking toward portals. These portals will spawn randomly. Usually, if you're in the center area of the room, they'll spawn behind you somewhere. And once you're charmed from Dominion, you'll start to walk toward the portal. If you touch the portal, you will die instantly. You can't avoid it. So once you get charmed, you'll get two new abilities on your main hotbar. The number one ability will instantly break you out of the charm. So if you are, say, a healer and you get charmed and you can't afford to be charmed at the time, you want to get out quickly, just hit your number one and you'll be out in a couple seconds. Uh, there is a small delay and a global or two that you'll have to waste, which is really unfortunate sometimes, but just uh, keep that in mind. However, your second ability when you're charmed is number two, and every time you press this button, it will give you a stacking buff called Stolen Power. Stolen Power does 3% increased damage or healing from you uh, for 15 seconds per stack, and it can stack to 150 at max. And this number two button stacks this up every global cooldown. And it actually uh, is faster with your haste and all that good stuff. So if you are able to press it uh, many, many times while you're charmed before you have to press number one, just before you hit the portal, your stack will get really high. The stack actually increases exponentially every time you hit the button. So the first time you hit it, you gain one stack. Then the second time you hit it, you gain two more stacks for a total of three. Third time you hit, you get three more for a total of six, and then four more for 10, and so on and so forth. So the best way to look at it is that if you can maximize the time you're allowed to spam number two and gain stolen power before you have to break it, then your damage or healing buff will be exponentially higher. So to maximize this, any charm player during this fight cannot be rooted or stunned, but they can be snared. And since 50% snare is pretty common, you'll want to find a way to uh, manage that. So in our case, we use Earthbind Totem from Enhancement Shaman very frequently. Pretty much every time we rotate, he has to redrop it, unfortunately. And then our uh, Balanced Shaman, or excuse me, Balanced Druid, <laughs> will also drop uh, his mushrooms on the ground pretty frequently for extra snare. So if those line up, this generally can allow people to get the maximum stack count, which is 150. But even one snare should allow you to get around 10 or 11 uh, button presses. If you're not snared, generally you'll only get 7 or 8. So that's a huge difference in damage. It's almost twice as much damage uh, output for that 15 second duration. 
And if you get charmed multiple times in a row, you can keep your stack going. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that the stolen power buff does not retroactively apply its damage to currently active dots. So if you have a dot active and you gain stolen power, that is not going to increase its damage. You have to reapply your dot or hot if you're a healer before the damage will, will take effect from your stolen power. So the best practice is to, as soon as you break out of Dominion um, and you have your 15 seconds of stolen power to reapply all your major dots and likewise a few seconds before your stolen power is about to fade, reapply your dots again because those dots will remember the damage that they were applied with even if your stolen power is gone. So this is really good for people with long duration dots like Warlocks, things like that. Anyway, so the real key to beating the Berserk timer, and we came really close, uh, that was really the, f the final challenge was enough DPS, is to maximize that stolen power stack. Uh, sometimes you'll get unlucky. It can cast on healers many times in a row. And uh, obviously this doesn't help your damage. Uh, that said though, if you are a healer and you get a chance to take advantage of it, it will really help your efficiency. So you'll see me, I get a, a chance to, to do it every so often, but sometimes you just can't afford to do it and you have to break immediately to land that uh, critical heal or whatnot. So the last thing worth talking about is the two major damage uh, attacks. There's still Electrocute, which happens every 10% of Neff's health. And on Heroic, this does an ex insane amount of damage. If you do not have a form of nature resistance on the raid, it will potentially kill your low health targets, like healers, mages, things like that. Um, this also means that when you are uh, charmed from Dominion, if you don't break it early enough, the resist um, buffs from the raid sometimes won't stack again right away. So if you break your charm just before Electrocute, Chances are you won't resist any of the damage, even if you have a resist uh, available, and you may it may kill you if you're a low health target. So if you have things like personal cooldowns or the TB trinket is really good for everyone here. If your DPS is not super crazy, you should be able to TB trinket every other cast, which is huge reduction. Um, so the other thing is still Shadow Flame Breath. That's really dangerous on the tank, so make sure they're topped off and healers should try to spam a big heal as it's about to cast. Otherwise, it's just a fight of DPS and attrition, managing the first phase adds, figuring out how you balance your damage and healing in phase two, and then getting your kiting and rotation down in phase three. So, pretty cool fight, very challenging, but it felt good to finally get down. So that was Heroic Neff, good luck and thanks for watching.
Where the mess? My bitches.